صدري ويسر لأمري وحل العقدة من لساني يقال قولي أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم صلاة والتسليما يلقاني بمقام أمير الأنبياء وإمام المرسلين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ولي الصالحين وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا وعظيمنا وحبيبنا محمدا رسول الله خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين صل اللهم وسلم وبارك على هذا النبي الأمين وعلى آله وصحابته الغر الميمين أما بعد جماعة المسلمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولولا دفع الله الناس بعضهم ببعض لهدمت سوامع وبيع وصلوات ومساجد يذكر فيها اسم الله كثيرا ولينصرن الله من ينصره إن الله لقوي عزيز صدق الله العظيم جماعة المسلمين سورة الحج verse number 40 We are not yet by the ten most holiest days for us in the year the ten days of Dil-Hijjah we are about to enter that and although I've chosen to speak on a verse from Surah Al-Hajj in the Holy Quran, my topic is not about Hajj. And I'm going to change the format of this pre khutbah slightly in the sense that I'm going to be translating some of the terminologies that I use for our other faith communities out there because this is a message not just for us. This is a message for all faith communities in this country and in the world. Because what we are facing now, Jamaat al-Muslimin, is the greatest existential threat to faith communities. Verse number 40 of Surah Al-Hajj. Where Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, God Almighty, the God who saved Noah and his family from the great flood. And who saved Abraham from the fire of Nimrod. And who saved Moses and the children of Israel from Pharaoh and his army. The one through whose power and will Jesus, the Messiah, the son of Mary, performed great miracles. And the God of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who took him on that night from Masjid al-Haram by the Kaaba in Mecca to Masjid al-Aqsa, to the furthest mosque built by Adam, Adam alayhi salam, and expanded by Solomon, Sulaiman alayhi salam, in which he led the prophets, as he said in that hadith, فَرَأَيْتُنِي فِي جَمَاعَةٍ مِنَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ And I saw myself in a group of the prophets. فَإِذَا حَانَتِ الصَّلَاةِ أَمَمْتُهُمْ And when the time for prayer came, I led them. His last and final messenger, Muhammad the son of Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I hope that the other faith communities, particularly the Christian community, 
and the Jewish community can find some commonality in what I am speaking about today. Jamaatul Muslimin, respected viewers of Hilal TV and all recipients of this message. Almighty God, the God of Abraham. Because our faith is what? Milla to Ibrahim. Qul sadaqallah. What did Allah say to Muhammad? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Qul sadaqallah. Say, O Muhammad, that God has spoken the truth. Fattabi'u milla to Ibrahim Hanifa. And follow the pure way of Abraham. The pure way of, of Tawheed, of Ukhdud, of belief in the indivisible divine unity of God. And worship Him and Him alone and associate no partners in that worship. He says in his final revelation, after revealing the Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai, what who he see in? Imagine that Allah even swears by Mount Sinai in the Quran. Such a great mountain it is on which he revealed that great book of his, the Torah. And the Psalms, the Zabur he revealed to Dawood, to the Prophet David, peace be upon him, and the Injil that he revealed to Isa ibn Maryam, to Jesus, the son of Mary, alayhi salatu wassalam. And then in this revelation, the final revelation, the Holy Quran, which God Almighty Allah Ta'ala revealed via Gabriel Jibreel alayhi salam to our beloved Prophet Muhammad Khair al-Anam salawatu rabbi salamu alayhi over 23 years. In Surah Al-Hajj verse number 40 he says وَلَوْلَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسِ I've done the Arabic, I'm going to move on to the English. Most important thing is that people must get the message. He says, and if it wasn't for the fact that God Almighty, Allah Ta'ala, repels the aggression of some people by means of others, destruction would have surely claimed monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques, in which God's name is often mentioned. And God will certainly support those who support Him. Indeed, God is all-powerful, exalted in might. Sadaqallahul Azim. Indeed, God, Almighty Allah Ta'ala has spoken the truth. Jamaat al-Muslimin, enough is enough. Genoeg is genoeg. Kwanele, kwanele. Yater, yater. Kifaya, kifaya. Wallahi khalas, we can't go anymore. We have now reached an impasse. We have now reached a gridlock. We can't, we literally can't go any further. What is being presented to us now, and what has been presented and is being implemented in other countries. Wallah, it's absolutely frightening. And not frightening in the sense that we are scared. Wallahi la nakhsha illallah. We fear nobody but God. Woman khashi Allah wahda, khawaf Allah jami'a khalqi minhu. And the one who fears God alone, God makes the entire creation fear that person. But it's frightening in the sense that we know and we've been speaking about this in this masjid for a long, long time about the trials and tribulations, about the fitan, like a dark night, which I experienced once upon a time in Somaliland, in Hergisa, when there was no electricity at night. And at the beginning and the end of a lunar month when there's no moon, if I walked to the masjid, to the mosque, in the morning for the dawn prayer for Salat al-Fajr, I could hardly see my hand in front of my face. And then I realized what the Prophet was speaking about, that there will come a time 
when the believers will be so ignorant of their religion, so ignorant of God, so ignorant of His commandments and the way and the life of His prophet and final messenger, that they will not be able to distinguish between right and wrong, good and bad, truth and evil. And so the frightening thing is, who of us are going to survive this? And who of us are not? That is the frightening thing. That is the thing that, that we should be worried about. Because what's going to become manifest now in this trial, and khalas, the tsunami is here. We are already in it. We've been speaking about it for a long time. The trial will come. The next trial will make the previous trial seem insignificant. And what is the purpose of a trial? Alif Lamim, Ahasib al Nasu, Ayutraku, Ayakulu Amanna, Wom La Yuftanu, Walakata Fatan al Ladina Min Kablim, Falia Alaman al Lahu Ladina Sadaku, Walia Alaman al Kadibi. Surat Al-Ankabut, Alif Lamim. Does mankind think that they're going to say, we believe. And they're just going to be left alone. And indeed, we tested those who came before them. In order that Allah might make manifest, that He might expose. In order that God Almighty might expose who are those who have fulfilled their covenant with Him and who are those who have broken and belied their covenant with Him. And in verse number 11, فَلِيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلِيَعْلَمَنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ In order that Allah might make known and might make manifest who are those who have truly believed and who are those who are hypocrites in the eyes of God Almighty, Allahu Rabbul Alameen. Wallahi said, no, Umar, Said no, Amr ibn Khattab, <laughs> who he believed to be the greatest person to have walked the face of this earth, the second greatest, the second greatest person to have walked the face of this earth after the prophets and messengers of Almighty God Allah Ta'ala. After Said Abu Bakr, Said Abu Bakr, we consider him to be the best after the Anbiya, after the prophets and messengers, after Rasulullah, Salawatu Rabbi Salamu Alayhi, Radi Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala Anhu wa Arta. Sayyidina Umar, of whom the Prophet Sallallahu once said to him, Ya Umar, anta siraju ahli jannah Oh Umar, you are the light of the people of paradise. Lo kana nabiyin ba'di kana Umar. If there had to have been a prophet after me, it would have been Umar. Yet Umar feared Allah, feared God Almighty so much that he believed that the fire of hell had only been created for him. And he was always hassling Hudayfa. Hudayfa ibn Yaman, the one who had the 17 names of the hypocrites of Medina. He kept wanting to know, is my name on the list? Is my name on the list? Hudayfa was not allowed to tell anybody. And then in the Khilafah, in the succession of Sayyidina Abu Bakr during his reign as Khilafa, I shouldn't say reign, we don't look at Khilafa as a sovereignty. It is only the representation of the one and only sovereignty, the sovereignty of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But during the time of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he still was bothering Hudayfa. Have you found my name amongst the 17 hypocrites of Medina? He refused to tell him. Eventually, when he became the Khalifa, he said, Billahi alayk ya Hudayfa. Have you found my name amongst the 17 hypocrites? He said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, ma'ad Allah, anta min ashratil mubashireen bil jannah. He said, he said, O commander of the faithful. Now, they were their nicknames. The nickname of Abu Bakr was Khalifa to Rasulillah. Khalifa to Rasulillah. The successor of the messenger of God. Said, no, Amr, they chose a new nickname for him because they couldn't call him Khalifa to Khalifa to Rasulillah. 
the successor of the successor of Muhammad of the messenger of God so he got the nickname commander of the faithful oh commander of the faithful Ya Amir al Mu'minin. I seek refuge in Almighty God from what you are saying. You are of the 10 people that have been promised Jannah. You are of the 10 people that have been promised paradise. How can you be a hypocrite? So, Jamaat al Muslimin, let us not be too sure of ourselves. May, may Allah save us. Allah save our children. Wallah, that should be. That should be the unwan. That should be the unwan, the title. Not just of this talk, of this movement. Of this pushback. The title should be Save Our Children. Save Our Children. Ya yeah, Allah. Jamaat al Muslimin. We can't. خلاص يعني. بلغ بلغ السيل الزبا. Arabic beautiful language, mashallah. بلغ السيل الزبا. You know the when the flood comes through the wadi, through the valley in the desert, it reaches the top of of the valley or the banks of where that water is normally channeled. And if it goes over, it floods the plain. It floods the plain. خلاص. بلغ السيل الزبا. The plane is flooded. The plane is flooded. We can't anymore. We've reached an impasse. We've reached a gridlock. As I said before, this is the greatest existential, existential threat to faith communities. People of different moralities can coexist. But you cannot have two opposing Moralities for one people. What did I say? I said people of different moralities can coexist, but two opposing moralities cannot exist for a people. It's like matter and antimatter. When they come together, they will destroy themselves. When they come together, they will destroy themselves. Now, Jamaat al Muslimin. This whole LGBTQ alphabet soup that we are drowning in. We need to dot the I's and cross the T's. We need to actually take a breath, take a step back and look at the bigger picture. What is actually happening here. Because... If we are going to allow conventional morality to be done away with, and I'll come back to that conventional morality. What is conventional? Conventional morality has been around for thousands of years. I mean, in terms of scripture, because that's what they refer to. When they say conventional morality, they're speaking about what we would call Islamic, Judeo, Christian values. We have common values. Especially when it comes to the prohibition of sexual deviancy. What we believe. And nobody's going to change that belief. Why? Because we have it in our scripture. And that scripture, لا مبدل لكلماتي. There can be no exchange for the words of God. And as we believe, the Quran is protected by God. Protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have revealed this revelation and we are and we are the protectors thereof. So Jamaat al-Muslimin respected viewers if we are just to speak about one particular letter in that alphabet soup the letter G which they refer to as being gay. gay. You know, I went to Sweet Valley Primary School in Bergfleet. You know where it's Bergfleet? And in our anthem, we used to sing 
chattering children on the highway, school bellies ringing through the morning air. Gaily we laughter. As they call Sweet Valley, we are here. What did gaily mean? Gaily meant happy. Gaily meant happy. No, no, that's gone now. You can't, you can't be gay anymore. It means something else. The rainbow, according to the Bible, was a sign of God's promise and covenant after the flood that he wouldn't destroy, ma destroy mankind with a flood again. No, khalas, the, the rainbow's gone. Even the zebra crossing is gone. It's been replaced by the rainbow. Let me, let me, let me, let me just uh, get straight to the point here. I'm going to warn you, I'm, it's a public holiday and, and I'm going to go over my time and I know especially the brothers that need to go to the toilet, feel free. Stand up and come back, inshallah. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. I grew up in a white English liberal society. I was born into a white English liberal society. My grandmother's first cousin was openly gay. My mother's first cousin was openly gay. I went to a primary school where there were two openly gay teachers and I went to a high school where there was one openly gay teacher and one openly bisexual teacher. Nobody harassed them. Nobody persecuted them. But at no time ever did they try and impose their lifestyle on anybody else. And therefore, and if they believed, because this is the biggest problem and I need to share this with you. Because if they believe that, because there's, there's one of, of two things that a gay person, they've got two options, basically. And let me quote you, let me quote you. A book written by Madsen and Kirk, two gay academics. They wrote a book called After the Ball. This was basically a book that was written for the gay community to basically, in inverted commas, clean up their act and uh, present an acceptable portrait of themselves to the community, to the broader community, to become more acceptable. And so they write here in this book, After the Ball, he says, once a youth has confronted his gayness, now look, I, I'm, I'm not attributing this to all gay people. I'm speaking from a, a gay academic's perspective. And two in particular, Madsen and Kirk, after the ball. Not painting everybody with the same brush. But this, is what, this, was, their, this was their advice to the gay community then. He said, once a youth has confronted his gayness, he has two choices. He can, number one, accept the received values of conventional morality and hate himself. Or, number two, step outside the conventional way of looking at things, begin to think for himself and form his own values, realize that Judeo-Christian, and including that Islam, because we believe that Islam is the origin of Judaism and Christianity. That's our belief. That's our belief. We don't impose that on anybody else. Because we follow the faith of Abraham and the law and the way of Muhammad. So he said, Number two, step outside the conventional way of looking at things. Begin to think for himself and form his own values. Realize that Judeo-Christian prejudice against homosexuality is arbitrary, absurd, and evil. And by rejecting it, replace his self-hatred with self-esteem. So in other words, like for example, the uncle that drinks too much, or the auntie that gambles too much. I mean, they know that drinking too much, not only is it bad for them, but coming from conventional morality, it's a sin. But you won't see the uncle, you know, trying to teach that to the small children in the family, how to drink too much. And, um, and if anybody says, you know, uncle, you shouldn't drink, Nobody calls them an alcohol phobe. Or if they tell the auntie, auntie, don't gamble. They don't call her, they don't call them a gambling phobe. You see, what is happening here, and this is where this whole 
thing of tolerance has completely been twisted and misconstrued. It's a fraud. It's a fraud. We're not saying there isn't intolerance or even violence against people committed against people of the LGBT community. No, it happens. It happens. But generally speaking, and I've said this the other day, for as long as I've been in this community, I've never heard of an incident where somebody from this community who proclaims to be gay has ever been attacked or persecuted. Maybe ostracized, and that, you know, depends on the individual and the family. But uh, what's happening now is not just, this is not about human rights. This is not about gay rights. Everybody's so-called human rights are protected in the Constitution of South Africa. This is about us accepting their morality. This is about us doing away with our conventional morality. And then having it taught to our children in the school. This is what the Bella, the basic education law amendment is, is basically wanting to implement. It hasn't been implemented yet. I believe public participation has come to a close. But it still needs to be debated in, in Parliament. And I want Parliament to think very, very carefully about what is going on and what they are doing. Very, very carefully. Because this can spell absolute disaster for us as a nation. Absolute, devastating disaster. You see, this idea of conventional morality that I spoke about earlier. The fact that we believe in God with a capital G, like you see in the Bible, whether it be in the Tanakh, Torah Neve Im Ketuvim of the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament, or even some translations of the Quran, you will see they will write God with a capital G. The God of Abraham. The creator, cherisher, nourisher, sustainer, manager, controller, owner, and ruler of everything and everyone in the heavens and on earth. Now, this is the God that is mentioned in the Magna Carta. 1215, the supposed first Bill of Rights. We will differ with them on that. We'll differ with them on that. You know, the Quran was revealed over 1400 years ago. And there were other revelations that came before that in which the rights of human beings were enshrined. But nevertheless, in the Magna Carta, King John, it is written here, John, by the grace of God, King of England, Lord of Ireland, Duke of Normandy and Aquitaine, etc., etc. Know that before God, for the health of our soul. For the health of our soul. That's the Magna Carta. George Washington, 1789, he says, The propitious smiles of heaven cannot be expected on a nation. In other words, you can't expect God to bless a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. This is conventional morality. 1919, Irish Declaration. In the name of the Irish people, we humbly commit our destiny to Almighty God. God with a capital G. We the people of South Africa, Recognize the injustices of our past. Honor those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land. We remember June 16th today, the Soweto uprisings, 1976. Not so? Respect those who have worked to build and develop our country, etc., etc. At the end, may God, with a capital G, protect our people. In Kosi Sikilele i Africa. Morena Boloka Sechabe Saheso. Chotsian South Africa. God bless South Africa. Which God is this? This is the God of conventional morality. The one who has given us the criterion of what is good and evil, what is right and wrong, what is true and false. 
This is going out the window. I'm telling you, this is going out the window. If you would allow me, when we look at, for example, and, and this just to put in perspective how important it is for people of faith-based communities to be bound by their religious laws. I mean, we know. There can be no obedience shown to the creation if it's in the disobedience of the creator. Even if the state tells us to disobey God, we can't disobey him. And because the, the constitutions of conventional morality are based on scripture, are based on the Old Testament and the New Testament and the Quran, depending on which country. Originally, I'm speaking about. But now that they're throwing out these statutes, which find their, their origins in the divine, in the divine code, in the divine law, now we are actually, we are seeing we've come, we're coming to an impasse. We're actually at the impasse. We're going to collide. And we don't want that. Wallahi, billahi, tallahi, I take the three oaths by Almighty God. This is a call, this is a call, Jamaat al Muslimin. This, this call to action, this call to mobilize is a call to peace. A call to avoid chaos and mayhem, which we already see unfolding in other parts of the world. So we have, alhamdulillah, in the Quran, the Almighty makes it very clear. It's not for the believing man or the believing woman. That if God and his messenger have decreed a law, that they should have a say in it thereafter. And whoever disobeys God and his messenger have indeed gone manifestly astray. You know, and truly he is the Al-Wadud, he's the all-loving God. So he only gives us laws, he only gives us laws which are beneficial for us. Might be that you dislike something but it's good for you. And it might be that you love something, but it's bad for you. Isn't that how mom and dad brought us up? Well, this is Rabbul Alameen. This is the, the creator of, of all the worlds. He created us. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our faults. That's why he's given us boundaries in which to live. That's the difference between religion and liberalism. And not true liberty. True freedom is another thing. But the word liberalism comes from the word liber, the Latin word liber, which means to be free. Whereas the word religion, Anglo-Norman word religion, means to be bound. So they, they are the antithesis of one another. They're the exact opposite. The one is saying no, the freedom of the individual. To do what they ever want. This is hedonism. That the main goal of a human should be to fulfill their pleasures and their desires. This comes out of the Enlightenment. David Hume, the Scottish Enlightenment philosopher. When he said that reason ought only to be the slave of the passions. Reason ought only to be the slave of the passions. This is the mantra of the devil. To do whatever you want to do. Give in to your lusts, your desires, your whims and your fancies. This is the antithesis of conventional morality. So, and then there's that at the end of the verse. Wallahu ya'alamu. It might be that you dislike something, but it's good for you. And it might be that you love something, but it's bad for you. And what's the bitter pull? Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. And God knows and you don't know. 
that's what it means to submit and surrender. And there is a bitter pill on the slick. But Alhamdulillah, with faith, it's easy. Because we believe in Him. We believe He's the Creator. We believe He knows all things. He knows that which was. And He knows that which is. And He knows that which will be. He knows that which was. He knows that which is. He knows that which will be. And He even knows that which will not be. And if it had to be, how it would be? Put that into chat GPT. And see what you get. He knows that which is in the land and in the sea. Not a single leaf falls from a tree except that he knows about it. Nor is there a seed in the darkest depths of the earth. Nor is there any living organism or any dead matter for that matter illa fi kitab mubin except that it's in a book recorded by god who are we talking about so when moses spoke to the israelites bani israel in the desert what did he say to them this is actually the declaration of faith of of Orthodox Jews today. Shama Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. What do we say? Qul huwa Allahu Ahad. Ahad Echad. Echad ve'en yachid kayi yichudo. Ne'elam. Ne'elam. I forget the end of that part. But it's very interesting. When you look at that concept of Tawheed, of Ukhdud, of pure monotheism, pure monotheism, perfect monotheism. Say He is God, the one and only. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad, the eternal, the absolute. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He beget not, nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kufu wa nahad. And none can be likened unto him. So when Moses is speaking to the, the Israelites in the desert, he says to them, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. Most singular of all, concealed and yet also without bound. No, it's actually things that we can sit down and talk about. There's actually things that we can sit down and talk about with instead of arguing and going on and fighting. We can, and this is the time where faith communities have to come together. Then we go on to verse 17. He says, You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his provisions and statutes which he has commanded you. You shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord so that it may go well for you. And that you may go in and take possession of the good land which your Lord swore to give your fathers. This was in Bani Israel, as mentioned in the Quran. When they were entering the land with Joshua and Caleb into Al Ard al Maqaddas, into the Holy Land. And he says in verse 20 When your sons, when your children ask you in time to come, saying, What do the provisions and the statutes and the judgments mean which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Wallahi, if, if, this, if this law is passed, as well as the hate speech law, as well as the sex trade law, they want to legalize prostitution now. The bill is up for, up for passing. Sex trade, sex entertainment, sex exposition, sex education, sex, 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 sex. Is the means a mouth? That's still a nice word. We in the masjid, you must be careful, you know. <laughs> so, um, he says, we were slaves in fear. And why do I say that? Because Alexis de Tocqueville, who was part of the French Revolution, but he was a Catholic, he was a believer in his faith. He said, you cannot have liberty without morality and you cannot have morality without faith. If they remove our faith, we lose our morals. If we lose our morals, we all become slaves. Like Bani Israel, like the Israelites were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. 
So he said, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Moreover, the Lord provided great and terrible signs and wonders before our eyes. Indeed, what did we read earlier? Indeed, God aids those who aid his religion, who aid his cause. Moreover, the Lord provided great terrible signs and wonders before our eyes against Egypt, Pharaoh and all his household. He brought us out of there in order to bring us in to give us the land which he sworn to our fathers. So the Lord commanded us to follow all these statutes. All means all. Like Ahmad Dirad used to say. All means all. To follow all these statutes, all these laws. To fear the Lord our God for our own good always and for our survival as it is today and it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to follow all this commandment before the Lord our God just as he commanded us this is the same concept this is the same concept we whatever whatever God Allah Ta'ala has commanded us to do what do we say five times a day Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarak tiyadha al-jalali wa ikram Samia'na wa ata'ana Sayyid Jama'a Again One more time We hear and we obey We hear and we Is this a fairy? Is this a fairy tale? Is this just a culture? Is, is this just a story? Like Richard Dawkins The big atheist He made that uh, documentary The story of God It's just a story it, Or is this something That we believe so strongly in that we are even willing to die for it. Jamaat al-Muslimin, we are khafalak, bay khafalak. Allah, 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 Allah. So I've got the Bella bill in front of me here. And uh, look, I'm not an expert of the law. Um, we've heard, we've seen some clips, I think one lady from the AZDP was explaining to us about the, 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 the thing that we as faith communities fear the most is what? Is comprehensive sexual education. Comprehensive sexual education. Where, and I stand to be corrected. I stand to be corrected. Where children at schools, primary and high school, I don't know exactly at what they're going to be taught in what standard, but they're going to be taught all forms of sexuality. Heterosexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality. They're going to be taught how to masturbate. Uh, forgive me, wallah, I ask you maf. But wallah, we have, to, uh, we have to face these things head on. We have to take the bull by the horns. And, and what makes it even more scary... Again, scary in terms of losing our children, losing our grandchildren, losing our future generations to this immorality. What's even more scary is that as a parent, if you don't send your child to school or even homeschool them and implement this curriculum, you could be sent to jail for 12 months. Yes, I'm not trying to create any you know, pandemonium here. This is, this is a wake-up call. This is still going to be debated in parliament. So we are just sending a friendly warning that the politicians must act in the best interest of the people of this country. How are they going to teach our children about homosexuality? Please explain to me. Please, somebody tell me how they're going to teach what a man does to a man in, an home, in a homosexual act. You know, I, 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 I pulled it up here. Yeah, there's it in Hebrew. This is uh, Leviticus. Leviticus 18, verse 20. Ve'et zachar lo tishkav meshkevei isha to'evahi. The translation thereof. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It's an abomination. Who's speaking here? God. Allah. With a capital G. The same one mentioned in our preamble of our constitution. In Kosi Sikilele, in Africa. 
God bless Africa. God see in Africa. And for the Christians who follow the New Testament only, Jude verse 1, Jude chapter 1 verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and actually there were five cities, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adme, Zebuim, and Zohar, all five of them were destroyed. And why were they destroyed? Because of sexual deviancy, mainly because of homosexuality. I mean, the Canaanites used to idol worship, sacrifice their children, practice all sorts of sexual deviancy, homosexuality, even bestiality with animals. Akramakumullah. It was for that reason. That's why I say, this is like the rise of the Canaanites. Abraham versus the Canaanites. Who are you going to be with? Whose team are you going to join? On whose side are you going to be? With Abraham or the Canaanites? That's what it boils down to. So, how is the teacher going to teach our children? My children are all finished school, but we've got grandchildren. How are they going to teach them about homosexuality? Now, I don't know if it's because of my Irish blood, but I love poetry. So, I wrote a little poem to make it a little bit more understandable. Can I share that poem with you? Would you allow me? Aye. <laughs> the teacher says, gather round children from all over the nation. Now is the time for sex education. That could be a cause for some consternation. But now it is written in our legislation. So let me continue with my explanation. Quite simply, it's all about a little stimulation via the old orifice of man's constipation. But teacher, sir, but teacher, sir, says one of the children. But teacher, sir, what about God's revelation in which it's described as a sin and abomination and a cause of social and moral degradation? Yet you teach it with tyrannical indoctrination. And in the end, a country in total devastation, all because of your sex education. Have these people lost their minds? And Jama'a, wallahi, when you see where this is coming from, Wallahi, when you say with, we see where this is coming from, Wallahi, it'll make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. It will, give, it will bring a cold chill down your spine. This is coming from the father of the sexual revolution, Dr. Alfred Kinsey. A homosexual, in fact, he was bisexual. He was married, had an agreement with his wife. You can have as many partners as you want, and I'll have as many male partners as I want. And he was a pedophile. In fact, he employed multiple pedophiles to, and he gave them stopwatches and he collated data on the sexuality of children from the ages of two months till the ages of 15 years. It's in the research. Judith Raisman, who passed away in 2021, whose daughter was molested and eventually died from the trauma. She wrote several books. Look her up, Judith Raisman. And there's a documentary on YouTube called The Kinsey Syndrome. Watch it. It is very disturbing. But we need to know where this is coming from. This is coming from Kinsey. Kinsey was, and up till today, according to Michael Bedwell, who's history advisor to the LGBT Legacy Project and multiple publications approaching 50 years of writing and activism, he says that Alfred Kinsey was our stonewall. He says there was a time when one out of every two Americans Gallup polled knew Alfred Kinsey's name and to gay men, lesbians, and bisexuals, he was a living hero. And what did Kinsey say? This is now in, he wrote two books. 1948, The Sexual Behavior of the Human Male. And 1952 or 53, Sexual Behavior of the Human Female. He writes, 69% of men frequent prostitutes. This is a fraud, a total fraud. 
He took like the worst of society. 25% of his people that he interviewed, the 18,000 interviews, were prison mates. And the others were exhibitionists and sex offenders and pedophiles. He was in contact with one pedophile that molested 317 boys. And a Nazi pedophile in Germany who killed a girl that he raped. He even went so far as to try and get the diaries of Alistair Crawley, the Thelemite. The Thelemite. Do you know what Thelemite means in Greek? To will. And you know what was their mantra? Thou shall wilt what thou shall will whatever thy wilt. Thy, thou shalt will whatever thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. In other words, you'll do whatever you want. Whatever satisfies your desire, that will be the whole of the law. Is that, is that compatible with, with conventional morality? Is that compatible with God's law? Shema <laughs> Muslimin, I know I've run out of time. He said 85% of men have premarital sex. 50% commit adultery. 10 to 37 percent are homosexuals. This is in 1948. It was absolute rubbish. He said, "Women." And this is a, 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 um, a statistic he did of white women. He falsely claimed zero percent are harmed by rape. He said, "50 percent have premarital sex. 26 percent commit, and 50 percent desire adultery." 87% of pregnant single women uh, have abortions and 25% of wives have abortions. It was rubbish. It's been totally debunked. And alhamdulillah, I've got some good news for you. The Kinsey Institute, which was started with seed money from Hugh Hefner. You know who's Hugh Hefner? Playboy. Playboy. They say Kinsey was the father of the sexual revolution and Hugh Hefner was his pamphleteer. And you know who funded, you know who funded the, um, the research of Kinsey? The Rockefeller Foundation. They eventually pulled out, but today I see 193 rainbow flags flying around their center in New York. What is going on here? And then, and this is, this is the most scary for us as parents and as grandparents and for our future generations. He said, children can benefit from sex with adults and even incest. Children need early explicit sex education. And he said specifically, yes, sexual education. Children need early explicit sexual education. At this time, all of these things were illegal. And he said, children need masturbation, hetero, and homosexual acts taught to them. Allahu Akbar. Do you see what's happening in America? Do you see? Do you see what's happening? Do you see the, the books that are already being, the pictures in the books that are being taught to the children? Do you see the drag queen story hour? Have you seen that? Men dressed up in fishnet stockings and g-strings telling stories to children. Have you seen it? Have you seen in Canada a man with huge prosthetic breasts in a miniskirt teaching a woodwork class? Christian pupils being suspended for their beliefs. Have you seen it? A man being jailed and fined 30,000 Canadian dollars for trying to stop his daughter's Transgender reassignment surgery. And we have a very similar Bill of Rights to Canada. America, there seems to be more freedom of speech. And the conservatives are pushing back. The conservatives are pushing back. Well, Jamaat al Muslimin, I don't know about you, but from today, I'm also pushing back. No advocating for violence or damage of anybody's property against anyone or any institution or anything. We want to go back to the status quo, the acceptable status quo, where people can do what they want in the privacy of their own homes. 
They can follow their own morality. Nobody's going to bother them. Nobody's going to persecute them. Nobody's going to harm them. Nobody's going to interfere with them. But leave us alone. And by God, leave our children alone. You show me. Show me. Show me. A man of any decency that will allow his children or grandchildren to be exposed to this filth. Well, it's filth. It is obscene. It is vulgar. It is offensive. If that's how they want to live, God will judge them. We don't even hate them. Hate the sinner. Hate, hate the sin, not the sinner. Hate the sin, not the sinner. This is what we've been taught. This is what, this is what Lot said to the people, to his people. Lot. What did he say to his people? He said, indeed, that which you do, I detest. He didn't say, I detest you. He said, that which you do, I detest. So, Jamaat al-Muslimin, we need to speak to people from other faith communities. We are now tired of this. We are tired of this proselytizing. And woolies. Ah, woolies. Woolies. Remember I said that we, we, we're about to drop the ball? We're about to drop the ball. Okay, so Nas kicked the ball. And Nas ran for the ball, but Nas had kicked the ball too far. So as Nas was trying to catch the ball, he saw he wasn't going to catch it, so he flicked it to the back. And who came? Who came up the center? The donker cop from dispatch. Danny Gerber. And Danny caught the ball and he ran and he scored. Alhamdulillah, our United Ulama Council have given out a statement that they're calling for a national boycott of Woolworths. A national boycott. We're going to make an example of Woolworths. We're not going to take this anymore. We are not going to inter... We, can't, we can live, we can coexist with people of different moralities. But you're not going to impose their immorality on us. This is the bottom line. You're not going to impose their immorality on us. Six trade, six education, six entertainment, six exhibition. You know, in Sweden, there's a private federation that even went to the Swedish government to ask to have six as a sport. Wallahi, they rejected it. They rejected it now. They rejected it now. Sheikh Rushdi, wallahi, ana la akdib. Ana la akdib. Hadi al-haqiqa. And this is exactly what shaitan wants. This is exactly what the devil wants. Because this is how faith is removed from people. This is how people are corrupted. Through sexual deviancy. That's how we believe. That's how the Jews believe. That's how the Christians believe. Jamaat al I want to leave you with one verse from the Holy Quran. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الذين يريدون أن تشيء الفاحشة في الذين آمنوا. Indeed, those who want to spread فاحشة, immorality amongst the believers, they'll be punished in this life and the next. What does one of the Allah say? Allah one of the Allah says, يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان. Oh, those of you who believe, don't follow the path, the footsteps of Satan. وَمَنْ يَتَّبِعُ خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ فَإِنَّهُ يَأْمُرُ بِالْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ For indeed those who follow the footsteps of Satan, who calls to all immorality and wickedness, he said, then let them know that he surely bids all to immorality and wickedness. Had it not been for Allah's grace and mercy upon you, none of you would ever have been purified. We want to be pure. Ask anybody who has ever worked with a Muslim or a Jew. Or even visited a Muslim or a Jew. When you go into the toilet, what do you find? A stinza bottle. We love purity. Purity on our bodies. We can't pray unless our bodies are clean. Unless we have our front and the back is both clean. The place that we are praying on is clean. And most of all, we want to keep our hearts pure and clean. So when we stand in front of God on the day of judgment, the day when wealth and children we have no use to anybody except for the one that comes to God with a clean sound and pure heart it's either that Jamaat al-Muslimin or we have to pack our bags and head for the mountains 
Or is, is the government, one, if they pass the bill, are they going to set up concentration camps for us? I mean, I know we Muslims, at least we at least a million. Come on, we do. are they going to put a million people? Are they going to lock them up 12 months at a time? Because no, I can tell you from the Muslim community, I want to answer from you. Are you going to allow, are you going to allow the teachers in school to teach your children about homosexuality? Are you going to allow them? Otherwise, like I say, Jamaa, we have to. So, yet, Alina Zaman, Ni'ma Rajuli Yakhud Ahlul al Jibar. It's going to come a time when excellent is he who takes his family and goes to the mountain. Who takes his sheep and goes to the mountain. Yanju Bidini ibn al Fitna. He escapes with his religion from the trial and tribulation. May Allah grant for. Our government, which I believe, I believe they're not going to pass this bill. I have, I, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. I believe that, that mo convention, conventional morality will prevail. And common sense along with that will prevail. And this bill will not be passed. Along with the bill to legalize prostitution. Along with this hate speech bill, which will stop me and every priest and, and rabbi in their churches and synagogues and all imams in their masajid from even explaining any of the verses of Lot and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. We'll only be able to recite it and not say anything about it. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Are they going to take us back to the days of persecution? Because that'll be persecution. The persecution of the VOC, we spoke about it the other day. How any Muslim that was caught propagating their religion or practicing it in the open how they were tortured in the dungeon at the castle in Cape Town dragged to Gallows Hill hung on a cross broken from head to toe and then hung to death are they going to persecute people of faith in South Africa? Buddha check out my try check out my try and as for Stephen Khurtis who tried to um, humiliate our sister Sister Shamima from Al Jama'a party Shamima Dolly, Sali. Try to humiliate her, calling her the Mampara of the week. A Mampara is somebody who has got no sense. Stephen Grotus, he's the Grotus Mampara. Think before you speak. Let us, Jamaatul Muslimin, let us make dua on this day. And inshallah, you know, for me, I don't know about you. June is no longer Pride Month. How can you be proud of sin, of an abomination? God calls it abomination. How can you be proud of an abomination? This is no longer Pride Month. This is Youth Month. How's that? June, inshallah, going to be the month for the youth. We're going to think, especially in June, we're going to think about how we're going to save our children and bring our children up in a beautiful, pure and clean way with conventional morality that is pleasing to the Almighty. May Allah SWT guide and protect us all. May Allah SWT bring some, some sanity to our leaders and to our community and save us from this absolutely devastation that could possibly afflict us and our nation. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Masjid al-Sunni in collaboration with Masjid al-Fuqam will be hosting Kira'a program starting after Maghrib at Islamia tonight, inshallah. Please make dua for Ayyub who passed away in the week. He used to be the car guard at Masjid al Sunni for many years. Allah grant him high place in Janatul Firdos. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.